I love this picture from Michelle Dunaway. She's, she, I really like her as an artist. She's, I follow her in a lot of different uh, areas. And I love this uh, quote that a painting that is well composed is half finished. And one of the things that I, I say every time I teach a composition class is that if you, uh, no amount of paint can fix a bad composition. So this is an area that I struggle in sometimes, especially if I have a model or I'm out in the field somewhere trying, which is not often, trying to paint something, is I hurry up and I begin too quickly without preparing, without thinking it through and thinking about what would make a good composition or a good, a good landscape or a good still life. So hopefully what we cover today will really um, uh, touch on that. Can everybody see the screen okay with for bearing with me? So a painting that's well composed is half finished. So the more we learn, um, there's a thing in my in my 12-step Al-Anon group that's called KBDM, knowledge-based decision making. So the more you put in your arsenal, the more you have in your toolbox, the better your decisions are on every painting as you go forward. Um, so I hope today what we're going to cover is going to really help you with that. Um, I've got this will be in the notes, but I've used several different references here. Um, some books, some I uh, had a free PDF and I'll make that available to you on landscape painting for beginners. It has some great information in it. Um, and I'm gonna be using Edgar Payne uh, worksheets from his book on composition of outdoor painting. So I'll be sending you all this information in case you wanna do some further research. Um, these are some things we're gonna cover and we'll see how far we get. Um, I'll continue them again next week if we don't get them all covered, but I, I, I hope that we will. What makes a successful composition? How to divide up your space? Uh, unity and proportion. Focal point, center of interest. Uh, some of these things are, are pretty basic, but we're going to push them a little bit. I'm going to show you examples. Um, visual paths. Leading the eye in. Aerial weight and line, line weight and aerial perspective we're going to cover how to create more depth in your paintings, um, interval spacing, like with fences and posts and rows of, of crops, um, what to include, what to leave out, uh, competing subjects, action lines leading the eye, using the use of interesting shapes and how to make those decisions, movement, how to get movement in your paintings, and again, uh, creating depth. I have that in there twice. So you can see there's a lot of information here. This is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> there's a lot to learn. Um, and I will tell you that I have studied with a handful of landscape painters, not a lot, not as much as portraiture by any means. Um, honestly, did not get a whole lot about composition. Um, mostly technique and color mixing and you know making decisions while you're out there and little little pop-ups about composition here and there. But most of the time I just had to ask questions or rely on my powers of observation on why did you choose that tree? I studied with Kim Barrick one time and I sat down out at Radnor, uh, out at Percy Warner Park. I sat down and there was a big tree in the foreground and then the creek and then some pretty trees in the background. So I thought, well, those three elements would be great. Well, she came right over to me and she said, take that big tree out of the front. And I, she didn't ever really tell me why, but I always remember that. So every time I wanted to put that, that tree right there in the front, um, I kind of stopped myself. But I like to know why. I like to know the reasoning behind why do you make that decision. So when I come upon that again, I can make a better decision about it. Um, so I really still don't know the answer to that, except that I hope that as we're, we're you know, going through here, um, maybe that will be more apparent. So um, any, again, jump, wave at me or jump in if you have a thought about any of these or you have some experience with what we're talking about because I want to, I want to hear from you. Um, this is a painting by Wim, William Wint. And as I've looked at this a little bit more, I know I, I plan for us to do a study of an old master at the end of the last couple of weeks of this month. And I have another one picked out by 
Theodore Clement. Uh, but I'm looking at this one and thinking I might want us to do this one. Um, I, I want to do an old master study, someone who's been long passed away so that we don't have any issues with copyright. Uh, and I'm looking at what we're talking about today, and this covers a lot of what we're talking about today. So uh, I may send out a survey and ask you guys what, or if you have a suggestion of an old master landscape that you'd like for us to do a study of, I'm totally open for that. So um, a successful composition draws in the viewer, pulls their eye across the whole painting so that everything is taken in and finally settles on the main subject of the painting. And this was a, just a, a definition I found of a successful composition, and I believe that's true. If, and I say this in a, a lot of my classes, if you are out at a festival or walking through a museum and you stand and look at a painting for 30 seconds or a minute, then, then that artist has been successful in getting your attention and drawing you in. Because if you sit here and count that off, it's a pretty good bit of time. Um, if, if the person just totally walks by, you haven't been successful. So that's sort of an, um, a shortened version of what success is. And, I, and it's very, um, those of you who have done outdoor festivals or, or art, art shows, you know when you're sitting in your booth, when people stop, you know when they engage. And that's very gratifying when you see people engage with your work, even for just a minute. Um, so, so to me, that's, that's what we're talking about here with success, making a connection with somebody, an emotional connection, uh, some kind of a connection to do with maybe they out, making the place look like something in their childhood or something that they relate to. Um, and you're much more successful if you're a little more general in that area. You're not so specific, but you make a painting that will appeal to, you know, a person's memory of, of, of just a general place like in the Caribbean or in the mountains or um, so that's that's one definition. Um, I'm going to show you just some paintings by various artists and I just wanted to show you kind of the difference. This is a post by Dawn Whitelaw and I've studied with her several times. She's a wonderful teacher, wonderful artist and there this was an Instagram post um, a year or so ago she, she did this scene in, at Radnor Lake, and she did it twice. And it's a little bit blurred, the, the image is not that good here. Um, but I wanted to show you the two different versions of it. Um, she doesn't really make any comment about it, but she says, the, these are two 36 by 48 interpretations of the same idea. Um, does one of the other appeal to you more? I should have put them side by side. That would have been easier for you to, to compare. One of them is uh, the values are pushed more. This one. I like that one. It's a little more dramatic. Yeah. And then. It seems more real. Uh -huh. it, mm -hmm. The also, other, the road kind of leads you into the painting where there's the other one. It's almost like the road is cut off. Yeah, the, the road pulls you around the bend a little bit more in this first one. And there's a little pop of light down there at the end of the road, which is very effective. If you're going to take somebody down a road and it's dark back there, <laughs> it's not as inviting as if you have a little bit of light back there or you have something interesting back there, a color something that will pull the viewer back in and make them want to go down that road. Um, so there's so much to be learned by just studying art and looking at what, what works and what doesn't. So this one is much softer and the values, of, there is that big tree in the front. Um, this is a big heavy tree on the left side. Let's see how she handles that one. So you don't have a heavy tree on this one. Um, so, you know, there may be something, something there. So, um, yeah, so I wanted you just to see the, the two interpretations of that, that same scene in Radnor Lake area and um, just how it is, it, both of them are painted beautifully. She's a wonderful painter. Um, then these are just, as I went through my folders, and those of you who've been around me a while know that I have literally 
50,000 or more images of art from of art that I've collected through the years and I have them in all folders, different folders. Some of that's for teaching, but a lot of it's just for my own inspiration. When I'm working on a piece, I want to be able to go and find something similar to spur me on and give me ideas for color. And so this is um, an artist I really love, Connie Beal Coonley. Am I saying that right? Does anybody know her work? Um, I see her on Instagram a lot. And this was just a, a daily post. This is something on the easel. I don't even know if it's finished. But um, you read this painting um, from left to right, which is how we read. And it's a very comfortable way because the light is entering in from the left. And it's just hitting all those buildings. And so you, read, you don't necessarily come straight in. You read it from left to right as if you were reading a book. Um, it's just, I just think it's a beautiful painting. Um, so I wanted to just inspire you at the beginning and look at a few elements before we jump into the specific elements of landscape composition. Hey, Peach, I'm so glad you popped in. Um, all right. And this is one by John Potoshnik. We did um, a lunch and a video uh, series with him a couple of years ago. And I really, really, he's a good teacher and a good painter. He's more kind of Rockwell-ish in that he paints every little detail. So you'll see more of his work coming up. Um, he's very successful in creating depth in his paintings. And I wanted us to talk, John Potoshnik, and I'm going to be sending out uh, in the, in the, in the worksheets I'm going to be sending you, I won't, I won't have all these examples. I'll have a few examples, but I will have all the exercises in the worksheets for, that we're going to be do as, doing as far as drawing. Um, he uses a shadow in the foreground, and I see that a lot. Uh, one of the things I've just observed, and if you have any experience with this, please chime in. His shadow is not so dark and imposing that it blocks you. Hey, Christy. Yes. Can you spell his last name, please? Yes, it's. I should have had it written on here. It's P-O-T-O-T, -O -T, Patot, Schnick, S-C-H-N-I-K, Patoshnik, Patoshnik, Potato, Potato, I don't know. Um, but he's great, and you can, you can find some information on him. I'll try to send you all the links that I have to these artists as well. Um, but he's been really successful in creating at least four different um, depth of fields, fields of depth. I always get that backwards, but he's got that foreground with the shadow. He's got the focal point, which is very easy with that red barn and it's lit. So you can't miss it. And then he's got the, the trees that are in the at atmosphere back there that are foggy and cool and the sky. Um, and so this is, this is just one of my favorites. So I pulled some of these out. This is another uh, artist that I really admire, Kathleen Dumphy. And I believe it's, it's F-Y. I put P-H on there, but I believe it's D-U-N-F-Y. Uh, Denise, hop in there. Are you saying then that <clears throat> the uh, depth of field is created by light? And we're going to talk about some different ways you create that. You can use light, you can use color, you can use soft edges contrasting edges, line weight, if you're drawing. So we're going to look at those individually in just a minute. But I wanted, again, I wanted to show you just to inspire you a little bit, some beautiful landscapes um, and the way that people draw you in. Because again, we, the, the definition here is a successful landscape is one that draws the viewer in and lets them move through the painting to the focal point and hopefully not out. So that's another thing we're going to look at is we don't want to lead people right out the side, uh, which is easy to do. Yes. What caught me on that, this particular one was, there's like one, two, three, four la layers or four levels of the, the trees. Yes. You know, they're, they're clear and then less clear and then they just fade away. Man, it's so beautiful. It's very beautiful. And, and notice the, um, I mean, how many times do you want to put light poles in your paintings? But we're going to look at action lines and things that also help pull you in and give you some movement. Um, there is a little bit of movement and rhythm with those light. I mean, you don't always put 
electric wires in your painting. But uh, there's a painting by Richard Smith that I wanted to, to find and I didn't get a chance to do it where he uses clotheslines and he changes the clotheslines to make them feature the focal point. And um, so there's lots of interesting tricks that you can do. You have to learn to edit. Um, there's a quote by, I believe it's Degas that says, even in nature, one must um, compose or edit. So you have to, you have to figure out what works for you with your toolbox of, of, of knowledge, which is what we're going to hopefully build on today. This is another one that I just popped out at me by John Carlson, and he's a very famous landscape painter. Um, just the colors in this are just spectacular. And look at the sense of depth in there and how, how foggy and cool and atmospheric it is in the background. Um, and that little gate there kind of pulls you in. Uh, big, heavy tree in the foreground. Um, so there's no rules. That's the thing I forget to say uh, that I should say every time. There are no rules. There are principles that work and don't work, and you can always bend them and break them and see how you can push them. Um, any observations about this painting? And how do you enter this painting? From the front, the side, the top, how do you enter it? I'm in the middle. Okay. Like it's got that the little string at the bottom. It's a beautiful painting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you come in right down here. It leads you in through this gate. Um, and then I'll, I mean, I'm going to do, next week I'm going to cover trees and lighting the landscape. And look at these trees, how many colors there are in these trees. <laughs> So, you know, this would definitely be a good study. I have to look up. I don't know when John Carlson lived. So, but I think he's considered, I don't know. I won't even say because I'm, I'm not up on that. Here is um, a painting by Walter Koninger. Koninger, am I saying that right? Does anybody know his work? Um, and you enter this one down here. You come in through the creek pulls you back and you've got the diagonals and we're going to talk about those that kind of move you through the zigzag patterns. But there's such a sense of clean light, uh, beautiful crisp color in this painting. Um, and that's, I think, what drew me in. So sometimes it's the, the lighting that grabs you. Sometimes it's the color. Uh, sometimes it's the technique and how the artist painted it that's just incredible, that's either so realistic or it's so loose. So, you know, there's different things that grab you about different paintings. Uh, here's just another one I had in there. It's a, again, a lot of Dawns are blurred. I don't know if it's the photo or how I captured it, but this is one by Dawn Whitelaw that I thought was pretty. And there's the use of the complementary colors, the orange and blue, um, which makes, you know, uh, orange never looks more orange than when you put it next to blue. So there's that. And of course, Roger Dale Brown, I've done some workshops with him and, and um, I'm going to be sending you a link to, he, he let me record his demonstration a few years ago for the Mont Haven Art Society where he does a barn. I think I have that in here. No, I must have it in later. Um, and it's a whole, almost an hour of his teaching as he paints a barn. And so I'll be sending you that link in case you want to look at that. Um, but what I love is just the beautiful blue in this, you know, when you, when you're in out in Tennessee, the water's kind of muddy. It's not really all that pretty. <laughs> and so if, and, and if you're having a bluebird day, everything's really clear and it's a little harder to paint. I believe you planner painters can attest to that or tell me or correct me on that. You want to have a little bit of atmosphere and fog in there to create some sense of depth. But I just love this beautiful blue in the top of this water. And again, it's so beautiful because why? There's orange over here on the left. And the blue and the orange together, there's a kind of a yellowish orange up here. It's just beautiful together. If, if this were taken out, it would be a little drab, wouldn't you say? The colors. So learning how to use a little bit of unexpected color and that color is true because if a sky is blue that day, it's going to throw blue reflections. So he wasn't lying in this. Um, I'm learning the more, the longer that I paint, that when you see a little bit of beautiful color, pump it up a little bit, bump it a notch. 
and enhance it because our job is not to be a photographer and create just exactly what we see, but to, to expound on what we see, our interpretation of it, how beautiful it was, what a person should be able to look at your painting and go and know exactly what you loved about that scene because you've enhanced that scene and made it uh, so prominent. Um, any other comment about Roger's painting there? Some of you I know have painted with Roger. Yeah, he's awesome. All right, so this next little segment, if you wanna have your sketchbooks out, because I, I know you fall asleep if I, if I yak at you too much. Um, this is out of uh, Edgar Payne's book, Composition of Outdoor Painting. Does anybody have this book? Peach has it, yes. Um, it, I do not have, I thought I had it, and if I do, I don't know where it is. But these, there are uh, five different worksheets here. And if you wanna sketch the first box and then come back in and do those later, because I'm not gonna stay on them a long, long time. Uh, but these are basic forms of composition. And I think if you sketch these, if you like for this first one, if you draw five boxes, and you sketch them, they will be, and you write the name of them, they will be, um, you, you'll be able to soak them up more and you'll be able to, they'll be more tangible for you the next time you start looking and making a decision about your composition. Um, the first one is this, the steel yard composition. And that is basically a seesaw, um, uh, scales, weights, uh, with something very heavy and something lighter. And you'll notice that the lighter object is in a little bit to balance that off. Um, if, if the small object is way out to the end, what's gonna happen? The heavy object's gonna throw it off. Like if a, a big person sits down on a seesaw and a little tiny kid is on there, what's gonna happen? Pew, it's gonna knock them off. So this is just that sense of balance for the steel yard. Uh, and I found this image of Monet's haystacks and he's used the steel yard form of composition, a small haystack. And usually, you know, this is a rule that we don't usually use even numbered items, but how many of these did Monet paint? A bunch of these haystacks. Um, I should have looked up how much they sold for. <laughs> I bet it's in the millions, wouldn't you say? So he broke the rule of thirds of, of, of um, odd numbers and he did two haystacks, exactly what he wanted to do. So um, that's the first uh, form of composition in Payne's book. The second is the balance scales. Um, and I, I, as we go on through here, you'll see an example of that, but that's maybe you have two trees sitting and they're pretty equal. Um, and, or, or the way you're, you're painting your landscape, you're making it more, uh, the items more balanced on each side. There's not as much, to me, there's not as much um, interest in movement when you have that. It's kind of like a pear. And you have to be careful with that. If you have a pair of bushes, they look like two boobs. You know, you have to be careful how things look. So that's why three things usually works better. But he does have that included in his forms of composition. Then you have the circular, which is should be easy for you to sketch that, um, which I, I found this painting at the bottom. I believe I'm going to, I'll have another name here in a minute and I'll tell you who that's by. Um, but you see the lake just, this area of the lake or pond just makes a circle. And this little log down here in the bottom just points you back up. And so you just go around in a circle with this. And you see the different examples that he's got here of the circular. You, it might be clouds and trees that make a circle. But the reason that's effective is it keeps you moving around the painting. And sometimes you might use little pieces of color. I know, Paul, I remember one you were working on in class one time and you had used little pieces of blue to, or, or a certain color to just move the eye around the painting and give it that circular feel. Um, the fourth one is the S curve and we're gonna see that a lot that is used. That's probably the most common uh, compositional tool 
that you will see in landscape painting. Um, Joel Knapp talks about that. If you're standing looking at a, a creek and you're trying to decide how much to include, even if there's not an S in it, put an S in it, he said to me one time. So um, S's are really, and we're gonna look a little closer at why S's are so important, but basically it's they slow you down and give you a nice uh, interesting journey through the painting. Whereas a road shoots you down way too fast and is not as interesting as the, as the curve. It's the same in portraiture. Uh, I did a, a demo one time of Denise's granddaughter, um, Allie, and she, had, she was turned kind of sideways and curvy and she had a cowboy hat on and I put that big S through there was so much more interesting than if I had sat her down and done a mugshot type painting of her just straight on. The S curve is always a very interesting move you through the painting uh, technique. Um, the last one does not have a name on it. I'm assuming that is the steel yard in opposite, uh, in reverse the steel yard. Any, any comments or thoughts about those five forms? Are you familiar with, have you been familiar with these forms of composition? I know if you've done any kind of landscape. Okay, so, so they're new, they're new. Some of these are new too for me at times and I'm always learning, I'm always learning. So like I said, again, I'll send you these worksheets so you'll have them to do in complete. Um, so the next one, uh, wait a minute, that's the same one, hold on. Yeah, that's the same one. So here's, a, here's the S curve. Uh, this is a painting by Brenda Hasty. Um, I don't, I've seen or heard anything about her in a long time. She's a Nashville artist that I know of, that I've seen before at local shows, but um, just her use of pink in this road and just the S curve. Uh, just really draws you in, but that's an example of the S curve. Um, same, same thing here's um, Joel Knapp's painting of Craig Font. Um, and he's used the, he's used the step through. He has two trees there that's kind of balanced, but except they're not. He's pushed one tree back and one tree is closer but you have the two sides to the gate and you have the two trees that kind of are like bookends. So that's a little, I thought that was a little bit of an example of the balance scales, although he's pushed one back and kept one forward uh, on the trees. All right, this is the second worksheet. Um, and this is the uh, pyramid or triangle. And you notice in the little thumbnail sketches, and these thumbnail sketches are really important. So um, if I'm not giving you time to do them now, please go back and do them and I'll, I'll pause it. Would you rather me pause? Would you like to get all these drawn off? Somebody say yes or no. Yes, okay, so let me give you a few minutes and I'll just yak. And I wanna draw some myself uh, as well because I have no idea how long it takes you to do it. Uh, but the triangle is not only important in landscapes, but in the portrait, uh, we're taught that a, a triangle is a stable base. It's a stable composition. Um, if you do the opposite, an upside down triangle, that, th that looks like it's going to teeter totter. Okay. So uh, a portrait needs the shoulders to imply that there's a body underneath it. So, um, but I have seen some beautiful portraits that go, that are just the neckline and you don't see any shoulders on them and they're very successful. So it's not a hard and fast rule. I love the little thumbnail here uh, with the triangle of two trees and the cloud up there. It kind of makes a triangle in that composition. Um, another thing about doing these quick little thumbnails and these little um, sketchy notes, we'll call them, is it makes you hurry up. <clears throat> it makes you just hurry up and get the gist of it. And I want to tell you, if you will learn to do thumbnails for all of your work, 
if you will do three possible thumbnails before you start, even on a portrait, uh, even on a still life, if you'll do three possible, make yourself think, how could I do this three different ways? And then take two or three minutes to draw the simple shape, mass in the dark, and then lay them all out and make a decision based on the thumbnails. Thumbnails are, are so valuable. Um, carry around, like Joel Knapp does, a little small um, notebook. And before you sit down and do the painting, before you decide on an area, if you're painting outdoors, do some thumbnails. He does it. He's been painting forever. But he, he will quickly um, mass in a couple of different options. I'll see him over there flipping his pages while he's doing these quick little thumbnails. The second one is the cross. Um, this is a painting by, I believe this is Ann Blair Brown. And I use this in my other, uh, just my overall composition class. Um, and I talk about scale here because it feels to me, is a beautiful painting, but it feels to me like this guy is a little small for this size of a house. So that thing, that kind of bothered me and I thought, be careful with your scale. Yeah, Peach. You said the what's a little small? This man is a little small for, you know, oh, it looks, yeah, this he looks like a troll. he's small. Yeah. So, you know, I, again, I'm not correcting Ann because she's a wonderful and it may not be hers. I'm pretty sure it's hers. I try to put where the credit, where the paintings go. But when you look at the size of the porch here, that man would be a little, even if he, you know, he's not that far back. He's, he's, you know, right here. So scale is important. And that's why, uh, Denise, you know, you were talking about studying things that you're not interested in or interested in. Um, I've seen some wonderful landscape artists try to put a figure in and wreck the whole landscape because the figure was bad or try to put a cow in and the cows just totally, you know, everybody, that's all people can see is the bad cow or the, or the bad figure. <laughs> so that's why it behooves us to study a well-rounded um, uh, tour <laughs> of different genres as we're painting. Um, but here's, I feel like this is the cross, a little bit of the cross. Uh, form of composition because you see the sidewalk going this way and you see the sidewalk going this way. It's also a bit of a tunnel because you enter it from the front. So we're going to look at um, the tunnel composition here in a minute as well. Um, you've got the, the, the telephone pole, vertical, lots of verticals in this, the fences, the trees, um, the columns on the porch, and then you've got the, the sidewalk going horizontal and the other fence posts and the shadows going horizontal. So it's definitely a cross type of a composition. And then you have all this foliage that softens things up a bit. The third one is the radiating line. And I've got some good examples of that on into the, into the PowerPoint, but using, um, if, if you're doing a street scene or a perspective scene, you can use the light, the treetops, the sidewalks to lead the viewer down that path to the, to the focal point. And so just be watching how you can use lines. You see in these little thumbnails, they've used the clouds, the horizon line, the lines in the water or the land down here. All these items point to the focal point, whatever that big, dark thing is in the center. Uh, even in this landscape with the road going in, all the lines, the mountains, the horizon line, the, the road lines, they all point to the focal point. So that's a use of the radiating line to lead the viewer in. You also have the L for, format. Um, and I don't know, I think I found an example of that, but that's using a large object. Again, going back to my painting at, at uh, Percy Warner Park, I had that big tree and then the creek. And so you have to be careful because if you have something really big and dark like that, sometimes it can stop the viewer. 
because it's such a big imposing figure and you don't really you have to be careful in how you lead the viewer around that big dark object but the l or rectangular composition makes the makes the list here All right, I think I have another, let's see. Yeah, so I'm, I've got the same worksheet up and here's another example of the, um, the radiating lines. So do you see how the tree tops here, uh, the horizon line, the creek bank, the creek edge, the shadows, everything points you right here to the center. So that's an example of a radiating, and it's also a bit of a tunnel because it takes you straight in the front and down the path. But all the lines line up and uh, all are radiating. Here's another example. I love this painting by John Potoshnik. Um, he, it's the same thing here, but with the use of light. So you have this line, this line, the backs of the cows, you have the horizon line, the shadows are all leading in. Look, everything, this is radiating with light and everything is leading to this focal point. And they've, he's placed the focal point right here in the tic-tac-toe. We're gonna look at that in a minute as well, the golden mean. But if you draw a tic-tac-toe on here, if you put your focal point in one of the intersections of the tic-tac-toe, then that's, that's also an effective means of uh, drawing the eye in and putting something in a good position on the canvas. So again, I'm gonna send you the worksheets. If you didn't get done with number two, um, I'll send you that. Um, here is the third uh, composition worksheet. Uh, C, it's entitled, and you've got the upside down or the suspended steel yard. So um, I think what's easiest to see here is this landscape that has the, sh the boat and the shadows and then something else over here, a smaller version of the boat. And so that is the upside down suspended steel yard. Never thought about that. Never thought about Again, the more you know about these um, underlying uh, techniques, the more you can be deliberate in how you place things on your canvas. Um, the second one is three spot, it's called. I've never heard of this. But you see three items of varying sizes. Um, and they're, they're placed in kind of an asymmetrical way. So, you know, they would probably would look different if you had them all lined up in the triangle, but you see them placed, it looks like three rocks to me or three bushes. Uh, this this uh, lake scene or, or water scene, you can see how they have varied the size of the bushes. What's uninteresting is if you make all the trees the same size and the same shape. You always want to vary, and, and whatever you're working on, it just gets boring if you make things the same. So even if they look the same because they might have grown very similar, then you, it's your job to, to make them a little different in your painting. Um, and I, I think this, this is a Whistler painting, or Homer, this is Homer up here, the dog and the, the beach scene. And I felt like this was kind of the three spot because you've got these two figures that are kind of interacting. You've got this one and you've got the dog. So you've got three things that kind of move you around in this painting. Beautiful painting, by the way. It's one of my favorites of his. Um, let's see, the third one here is just called Group Mass where you group items together and you have, and you sit, you notice that it's in the um, intersection of the golden mean here, right here in the lower third. Uh, the boats are over here in the, the left third of the golden mean. And we're gonna talk again about dividing the canvas in a minute.
jump in there if anybody has a comment. Yes, Denise, jump in there. So I almost always, usually what I'm working with is some type of portraiture. I almost always use the golden mean to, to line everything up on my page to, to, for composition. I had no idea there was this many methods of composition. Am I missing out or am I creating something boring by always using the same thing or what? <laughs> That's a good question. This is, um, this is Edgar Payne's landscape um, forms of composition. I don't know where if, they, if these were passed down by somebody else to him. Um, I, I just think they're possibilities. I, I do think they apply a lot to the landscape because when you're doing portraits, you have a certain realm that you're in. Now, how the, the portrait thing applies, and I, I didn't find any, but like the triangle, that's really relevant. And so if you want to flip a portrait upside down and you want to make the, there's one by Jeremy Lipking I'm thinking of right now where the, he just has the V-neck on the girl and he didn't put any shoulders in. And it is a stunning painting. So it doesn't feel like she's going to tip over at all. Um, so I think just, you know, if, if you take away two new, one or two new ideas from this that's in the back of your mind on your next painting, then you've been successful, I think. I don't think you need to go memorize all these. Peach. I was just going to say to Denise, um, and this is just a me thing, if you're doing figures, not just portraits of faces, but if you're doing portraits and like figures and stuff like that, a lot of these compositional elements are necessary because too many times people just stick the face poof, right in the center. Yeah. And so you can use this stuff instead of trees and boats, it's limbs and it's a, a light or a chair or something. That's yeah. Just, there you go. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. It's true. I mean, it, it just put it in your tool bag. Don't overanalyze it too much because that's what I'll do. I'm like, oh gosh, how have I, I've been missing, I have been missing a lot of this because I haven't studied this in depth uh, like I have portraits because that's my thing. That's what I love. That's what lights me up. Uh, but I think it, it's all helpful the more you put in your bag, as long as you don't make it um, some kind of legalistic rule for yourself. <laughs> Remember to have fun with it. Any other thoughts about it? There are two more on this third sheet. Um, number four here is points of interest in the center. Now, we all know that if you give a kid a piece of paper and tell them to draw a house, where are they going to put it? Smack dab in the center. We too often still have that tendency to do that. It's just innate. And is it wrong? Not always. It's not always wrong. It's just not as interesting. It's like a mugshot. And that's what I say with portraiture. But this is a painting of Fitzpatrick, maybe. I don't, I couldn't read the, but it's just one that I happened to cross that they put the red barn smack dab in the center. Um, does it work? Does it not work? I don't know. But you can certainly, especially like if you're doing a figure, you want to move them over. If they're looking a certain way, you don't want their face to be right on the edge of the painting. It looks like they're in a box. So same with the landscape is you don't want your landscape to be like a bullseye necessarily. You want to, you want it to move it one way or the other. Usually if you have a road leading in, then typically you would, you would start the road over here and you would put the landscape here. And that just gives you a more asymmetrical. I, I don't know why asymmetry feels better to us as artists than putting things side by side, but putting them like this feels more balanced. Even brush strokes like that feel more balanced than if you just go boom. Because again, that's just like two boobs coming at you or something. 
And it's hard to see, these are really scratchy, but I think if you just draw yourself something to remind yourself, the center of interest is in the middle. It can work. And so it might be an interesting study for you to go and look through landscapes and try to find somewhere the, the center of interest is smack dab in the middle. The fourth one is scattered masses arranged. <laughs> um, that might be rocks, it might be clouds, it might be, um, I don't know, it might be uh, wildflowers that you just have boom, 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 boom. So we're going to look at some other uh, examples here in a minute of um, different types of paintings and how they've used uh, maybe bright color in one area, duller color, softer, varying the sizes to make that work just so that everything's not dot, 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 dot the same. Even if you're painting a tree, you don't want all your masses to be, you know, the, the biggest mistake I see as I go around and help people with trees is they just get a fan brush or they just get a little brush and they just make dots all over it that are equal. They're scattered dots and there's no form. There's no light, medium, and dark. There's no interesting clumps of leaves on their tree. So we have to go back in there and make scattered clumps, but they have to be, there has to be variety in them or they're just monotonous dots all over your painting. You so that's kind of mm -hmm. like the, uh, the, painting, the very first painting I did when I was in your class was that hayfield. Oh yeah, I remember that one, Teresa. Yeah. And so you 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 varied the sizes of the bales. Mm -hmm. They were right. Rolls, yeah. Right. And made some of them smaller, some of them less right. distinct, some of them right. uh, and less contrast in them. Yeah. So you, you want to think variety. You want to think movement. You don't want everything to be the same. It's just monotonous. All right. So here, oh, there's one more. There's a D worksheet. This one's just got four boxes. Uh, the diagonal line is probably the most common thing that you see in landscapes, I would say, because you see the, the mountains, the, the hills come in diagonally. Um, very, very easy to spot that the diagonal. And it's, it's pretty much a default. You don't have to work too hard on that. But you can accentuate it. Uh, this is painting on the bottom here is Edgar Payne beautiful painting and you see that he's used shadow in the foreground and a diagonal the midground is very warm warm color that's coming forward at us that's the focal point easy to see another diagonal here and then the mountains are so cool um and then for some reason look at that yellow sky interesting but you've got uh zigzag so you come in from the bottom zigzag up the mountain range there, zigzag back this way. Um, so there's your diagonal. <clears throat> the second one is the tunnel. And it might be a literal tunnel, uh, might be arches going in through a cathedral or a, a real tunnel, railroad trestle, um, a covered bridge, uh, a, just a, a road with tree, tree canopy on it. Uh, very effective, but you notice in Payne's uh, worksheet here that he's pushed the tunnel over to one side. So it's not smack dab in the center. And this painting, I don't know who this is by, but this painting is pushed over a little bit to the right. So it's much more interesting and feels more balanced to do that than to put it smack dab in the center. Now, I know that when class is over, <laughs> it's lunchtime and there's a gazillion things to do. So this is what I have to do for myself. And I did it yesterday is I have to put, um, if, if it were me, I would print the worksheets off, the ones I wanted to finish and stick them in my sketchbook and put them on my nightstand or where I sit to do my coffee or quiet time. So that as I'm sitting, 
I'll pick that back up and I'll finish out these little drawings. Um, again, I cannot express to you enough how doing a quick um, sketchy note like this will plant these things in your mind in a way that if we just look at them and talk about them, um, it, it doesn't do, it doesn't get the same point across to you. So I see everybody moving and doing it. So bravo, y'all get an A. Whew, I'm talking my head off. The third one is silhouette. And you see that a lot with backlighting. I'm excited to, sh to cover next week's um, segment on lighting the landscape because I feel like that's so important in all my work. Still life, portraits, um, flowers, landscapes. If you choose a beautiful lighting, a natural lighting or the golden hour, dramatic lighting, um, it's, it's just so much fun. Now, do you, we don't always do that. If you're really successful without the lighting, then, then that's a challenge right there. But I think the silhouette is a, a good opportunity. Is it easy? No. <laughs> um, if you get that dark, too dark, it just looks like a black hole. So I did a whole segment last year on uh, painting shadows and skin tones. Uh, and that is hard as all get out. You study some of Dan Gerhardt's portraits and see how he handles shadows. Um, it's tricky because if they're too dark, they look like a hole. And so you want to use beautiful colors to mix your shadows and you don't want them to be too black. And your photographs will make shadows black and lifeless. So that's where painting from life is so important because when you're out there and you see darks, they're not pitch black. And then the very last one is patterns. Um, and that, you know, you can kind of tell by these thumbnails. That's what I love about thumbnails is that you can see an interesting composition if you, in the thumbnail, if you go ahead and sketch the light, the, the values in there, light, medium, and dark, and you can kind of look at it. Of these three on the bottom, which seems most interesting to you? Does anybody want to comment? I like the, the tunnel. I like the middle one. Yeah, <laughs> Denise. I like the tunnel just because it leads your oh. eye into somewhere, into yeah. a, it's a destination. Yeah, yeah. But I and was torn between that and the silhouette. Okay. What about of the three bottom ones? Which one of, because those are pretty busy. And does, does any one of those um, read better to you? The far right one. Okay. Uh, you can tell, can you tell what it is? No, it just intrigues me. Okay, so it's a big, it's a big strong shape. The middle one, to me, I can see the little houses. That's what and I was going to say, the middle one. I was going to say it was just kind of blase there. Yeah. Didn't pop, the middle one. Okay. So, that, so there again, we all see very differently. And what attracts one doesn't attract the other. But you do, I want you to, to really see how a thumbnail, if you're successful with that little thumbnail, um, you, you're going to be more chance you're going to be successful with the composition on your painting. If the thumbnail is kind of busy and not interesting, then you don't waste your next five hours <laughs> trying to make a painting work when you couldn't, the thumbnail wasn't interesting to you. Um, I, we are very resistant to these thumbnails. I, I can tell you, I know this because I tell people to do it all the time and I'll come around, they do maybe one, maybe two but I push them to try to do three. And then even on just a scratch piece of paper, lay them all out and look at them. And you don't have to take more than five minutes to do that, but it's a very valuable tool. Um, and, and just have an idea of what you, where you're going and what, what works and what doesn't work. 
um, I believe, I can't remember the teacher now, but one of my teachers told me that uh, if you will look at a, an, a yearbook from school and, and just look at it from a distance and look at those heads, people who have, most of the time, you can recognize people from a distance by their features in a little bitty thumbnail. And as portrait artists, if we can look for that characteristic, um, it might be a heart-shaped face. It might be really strong eyebrows. Uh, it might be large eyes. It might, you know, figure out what that feature is. And then if you get that feature right, you're more likely to be successful with the portrait. And in the same way with a landscape, if you do your quick rough draft and say you're going to do those houses in the middle there, well, you make sure you have a beautiful S pattern moving you up the hill. And then you decide which of those houses intrigues you the most to make your focal point. It's because there's a whole side of a hill there and you've got to decide how to crop that and what's going to be interesting. So you could use one of these techniques in making that uh, a more successful composition. I hope I've yacked enough to give you time to sketch and put these down. Jackie, jump in there. You gotta unmute yourself. There you go. No, I was gonna say I gotta go. I was waiting. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I told you to That's do that. Good text. I didn't think you read it, but no. So. Thank you okay. for being here. Have a good afternoon. You too. Thank Watch you. Bye, everybody. Email. Bye, Jackie. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, I'll move us on through. Um, I have a lot of slides here to show you. This is um, Camille Preswadek. Some of you are probably familiar with her work. Yep, she's very colorful. She's a colorist. Uh, she's very loose and blocky with her uh, strokes. Um, it, are there elements that help you read this painting? I think just looking at, at painting sometimes really helps us with these, applying some of these concepts. How do you read it and what things help you read it? You come in from the front, the side, Peach. Yeah, jump in there. Well, I just sort of come in from the right here. Yep. VFR direct to the figures because of the way she uses light and shadow. To me. Yes. Yeah, me too. She can sneak in from the lower left hand corner. As well, or from the right. Yeah, yeah. Either way, it's beautiful. It's, I it's love her work. I love her work too. It's very clean and crisp. It's happy. Yes. It gives you a, a happy feeling because of her use of color. Uh, the figures are done well. So if you know if she painted all this beautifully and she had some kind of funky figures in here, there again you landscape painters, you work on your uh, proportions, <laughs> you know, get to know the, how to do the figures. So that if you, if you in, inevitably you'll have some figures you want to stick in there at some point. So um, let's see, cool color in the foreground, which is unusual because a lot of times landscape painters will put the warm color in the foreground. But what does that do? It jumps you over to the warmth right here because all this is light and warm. And so if you are going to have a big shadow in the foreground like this, don't make it so imposing and dark and colorless that it blocks the viewer. So I think that's really, really important. She's also got these little pops, Paula, like we talked about one time in class, of color that sort of move the red. They're not, they're different degrees of red. So you've got this really strong chimney up here, but it's not as intense as this color that's in the light. So they're all different in variety. And here's a little bit more warmth here. There's some warmth in the trees. Um, so it's just a beautiful combination of cools and warms. In the, there's, there's cooler temperatures in the, in the light and there's you know, really hot temperatures and there's warmer temperatures in the cools. This, vi this pinky violet is warm, warmer when it's placed beside this, this cool. Um, Looking at paintings like this, because when I'm standing outside looking at a shadow on a driveway, it's hard to tell what that color is. But she's pushed it 
purple, purple, purple. You know that's purple when you see it. So the, if the next time I'm standing outside and trying to figure out what that shadow is on the sidewalk, I'm going to remember this purple. Uh, just like on a wet day on a black asphalt, uh, the sun pops out and the sky has a little bit of blue and all of a sudden that black asphalt turns blue and it's just beautiful and it just gives you this um, heightened sense of observation and enjoyment. Um, so that's what looking at how others have interpreted um, paintings, that's what it does. This is by Brett Weaver. It's a cityscape and I will do another segment sometime on cityscapes because I believe they're a lot about perspective and um, making your shape smaller as they recede back. Um, but what elements does he use here to draw you in? And how do you read it? Where do you come in? Anybody? I've come in kind of from the left corner. yellow. The yellow, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where the people are too. Mm -hmm. The people help tell that story. So you enter down here and you come in and, and look how the variety of the yellow line. So it's it's stronger in color here. It gets a little bit lighter and it just disappears as it goes down the street. Um, there's not much opening there, but typically you want to be careful for the most part, to leave an opening so that as you, you pull the viewer in, you want to pull them around to what's in there. Not always, but I just noticed that in a lot of paintings, how they're, it's, it's a little more uh, effective when, when you pull the viewer in. Um, this will also be in your worksheets. This is um, out of a little free PDF that I believe the Artist Network sent me. I did not have that marked, but I have the whole PDF and I'll attach it. Um, it was very valuable. It's for landscape painting for beginners. Yeah, it says from the Artist Network. Um, how to divide space. Uh, divide it unequally, giving dominance to one of the divisions. Um, and so there again, we go back to the thirds. If you divide your canvas into thirds, um, and he's done that here, this artist has. Um, the front third is in shadow. The middle third here is in light and where most of the action is happening. And then the sky, and you could divide it right here really to make it even. Um, but, but typically thirds are a rule of thumb. Now we did see some paintings where you step back three or four or five levels. So that, that's also a possibility. Um, here again, avoid dividing your canvas in half. Uh, it's just not a good compositional thing to do, but it, you see it works sometimes. So again, no rules. Don't place a tree trunk or a telephone pole right in the middle. Be careful with that. Um, and it says in this one, I don't know about this, avoid lines that go diagonally from corner to corner. This divides the composition into two equal parts and directs the viewer's attention right out of the picture. So you see the diagonal here with these little streams, but you notice he's not going, he, it's dark over here. So this darkness keeps from taking you out of the painting. That little bit of a darker, that's probably the darkest area of the whole bottom part. So here's the little golden mean, uh, some various interpretations of it. This is going to be in your notes. Um, I thought this was helpful. This, this came off of Pinterest, drawing lessons for the young artist. <laughs> um, and we are all so young. I thought it definitely applies to us. Um, the horizon line either above the middle or below the middle. And that's an important thing to decide before you start any piece. What is my focal point? Do I want this to be about the land? Do I want this to be about the sky? What is the thing that grabbed me? Decide that from the get-go because that, that'll tell you exactly where to put your horizon line. Um, don't, do not put it in the middle. It's boring. That's what they say. To make a picture look more realistic, give it a background, a middle ground, and a foreground. Um, 
It says the background is pale and almost has no detail. The middle ground has more color and detail. The foreground has the most color and de detail. That's not always true. You can decide to put your focal point in the middle, but be sure you don't block anybody from getting in. Don't put a big dark fence in the front to block people. And I like this little second drawing here because it gives you a little bit of a diagonal here. So you're dividing it into three sections, but you also have a little diagonal. Maybe that's shadow like the one we saw in the, in the other picture. Every picture should have a point of interest, not right in the middle. Um, use a road, a river, a fence, a post, a curve of the hills to bring your eye into the picture. And you can decide how you want to do that, where you want to lead the viewer in from what side. The most natural way is left to right because that's how we read. Um, and you'll see that portrait artist light, usually the light's coming from the upper left for portrait artists, just because that's most natural the way we read. So here's a little bit about unity. Um, does it feel like the elements in these paintings belong together or are they separate bits that just happen to be in the painting? So I like to look at this for a minute because I believe sometimes I get too uh, busy and detailed with a painting and I make everything, yeah, I make everything too busy and I, I give, you know, we'll move from the tree to the rocks and we work on the rocks then to the to the other tree and then to the path. And if you make everything equally important and busy, it's hard to know where the center of interest is. And it honestly, it tires the eye. So we see the way the eye sees is whatever we're looking at. Like I'm looking at Heather right now and everybody else is a little blurred. And the further out mark speakers and the lamp is all really blurred. So if you paint that way, so that the focal point is the most important thing and most detailed and refined, and everything else is, has hierarchy of importance, it's much more effective. All right. Um, the, the bottom, this bottom picture I always use is because it's helpful to me, I think. I don't know who the painter is and I don't wanna be derogatory about it but I do think there's some things that could have been done a little bit better. Do you see any problems with the blue door, the uh, painting at the bottom? Do you see any suggestions as to how this could have been improved? And it's okay if you don't, I'm, I always have a, a little bit of silence just cause I'm yakking so much. This is Teresa. Is it is that a gate blocking the door? Yes. <laughs> Yay! Bing, bing, bing. You got it right. <laughs> I um, couldn't tell if it was a gate or wooden steps or what. <laughs> it could be a bench. It could be a gate. It is blocking the door. And then I believe that's a horse over to the left. Um, the horse is, maybe it's tied up, but it's, it's just the horse's butt and it's facing out, it's not leading in towards, the blue door is obviously the focal point because it's the blue and orange, you know, are really contrasty. But, you know, give your viewer a path in, don't block the way, and make your elements, you know, if, he, if the person had used the radiating lines here, made the horse turn a little bit toward the, you, you might have had to have done, if you took photos of this and the horse was only that way, you might have had to go do some research and find a horse that was pointing that way a little bit more. It might have been a little bit more effective. So again, I just want to get you to think a little bit. You come home from a vacation or something and you want to paint that spot or you got started there and you didn't get finished and you have these elements and you just sit down and become a copyist. Um, you know, use these concepts, these these forms of composition to help be more successful in, in leading the eye and leading the viewer. Um, this one, I love these, this example, I found this um, online. 
the the top left image has two deer and let me see if I can move this. Yeah, let me move this down. Yeah, it just has two deer and they're both very similar. They're pointing in the same direction. The second one is a little bit better. The deer, there's a variety in the size and he's turned them different. The third one is the most successful because he's created a sense of depth with making that third deer smaller and they're all three facing different. They're not similar. Now, if you're out and you see a bunch of cows, uh, they're like schools of fish. It seems like a lot of times they're facing the same way. So that's, that's how you're going to see them a lot of times when you're out. They all look like pretty much the same. But, but you see how you can edit and you can make your picture a little more interesting. Not that this one's bad. Yeah, Teresa, uh, Denise, jump in there. That's what you did when focusing on painting the ducks. Mm. Uh, you weren't just a copyist there. You chose an arrangement. Uh, you were trying to trim down the time, but at the same time, you were using these principles to come up with a good composition and not paint it, not be a copyist of that whole painting. Good observation. And so sometimes you don't even know once you've, talked about these things you've written about them you've you've pressed them in a little bit but the next time you sit down you you have these things in your repertoire to make the decisions you don't even know you're using them sometimes but they are important and i believe even if you know them it, for me it's important for me to go back over these again uh because they 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 freshen them in my in my mind so that i'm using them again thank you for that observation denise um but the way we turn things and the way we place things and their size is very important, their dominance. So the first deer is probably the focal point right here because he's most defined, he's sharp and contrasty, he's close to us. And then you step back through the painting and you read it. You almost read it in a circle a little bit because the creek brings you back around. All right. Uh, so S curves. These, this is a, a very um, important thing when you're painting pathways, uh, uh, sometimes streets, pathways, streams, creeks. Um, I use it even in, in, in portraits, um, looking for the S's. Um, you should enter with an S. The second option, which usually is not as good, is a curve. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not quite as enjoyable to just go like that as it is to, to slowly move back with that pretty S there's an S like dancing, you know, that even just doing your hands like that feels better than just there's a dynamic and a, an emotion to that. Um, here's an example of an old master type painting and you see the, the Creek and not only is the creek essing back or the 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 river or, or whatever it is um the sides are are s's so be careful with that that you don't just shoot down with straight sides of the banks of a creek and notice how even as the creek as the uh, water goes around the back of these buildings the side of the roof of this building on the right takes you up to this little lighthouse back here. So you've got this beautiful S shape. Here's a similar one, wow. Oh, that's a close up, okay. So I wanted to show you what happens back here. Even though the, the water doesn't go, doesn't continue, there's lost edges right here. And everything is very soft and foggy back here to create that that depth. Let me show you the original again. Look how bold and sharp and contrasty these, this left side is. And then as you move through the painting, look at the softness. Um, lots of white in with the same colors that they've used, he used. This is, I'm going to pause here for a minute and let you, uh, we've got about an hour, so we're still doing okay. If you're asleep, get up and stretch for a minute, go get you a little sip of coffee or a drink of water. Water wakes you up. If you have a little chocolate covered almond or something, eat that. 
this exercise, if you don't do any, is important um, to draw these four boxes because we try to make these S curves and um, a lot of times you forget to put them all in. They're compressed and squashed. So I'm gonna give you just a minute to take a break. Oh, I feel like I have y'all in school today. I feel like the mean teacher that's cracking the whip over you. It's a lot of stuff, but it's it's really good. I hope it's not. <laughs> I hope it's not overwhelming you too much. That's a no, good one. No, no. I'm just uh, I write what I can and then hoping that when you post all yes. that, I'll get caught back up. So yes, no, I've been. Should have sent it to you ahead of time so you could have had the papers there. I didn't even think about that. I usually oh. do that in class. I have the papers there. But listen, I will tell you that if you just look at it, it's one thing. But if you do it, if you write it, it's a whole nother ball game. So if you'd have had the papers, you'd have had a tendency not to write it out. Yeah, can I kind of help helps remember when you write things down. It does. Even if I never refer to it again, the fact of just doing it makes a big, mm -hmm. big difference. Well, something will come up and you'll go, oh, I remember that, you know, and you might go back and track yep. it, you know. Yep. I keep everything. I know. That's a problem around here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to stand up for a second, too. <clears throat> One of the things I got this weekend from the uh, portrait conference was a lady came in and did um, body movement for artists specifically. And I, I got to watch just a couple of, of bits of it, but she gave some um, exercises that will really help. And one was to take your fingers like this, because our fingers are usually cramped doing something like this. So she had to squeeze our knuckles as tight as we could like this. Now, if you have problems with your hands, this might be uncomfortable, so don't do it. But then squeeze your thumbs and then bend them in like this. And then go and do that several times. And you'll notice your, my fingers are sore when I do that. So anytime you have soreness in your muscles, there's, you know, there's some inflammation in there. And she, uh, I'm going to try to, watch this and share some things with you as we go because the older we get the stiffer we get and stretching is so important stretching and stopping and being mindful of your muscles and so just doing that a couple of times really helps to um, work the soreness out of your hands boy we need our hands don't we yep we do so let's take care of them All right, let me move us on. So I wanted you to do the do these. Um, I had the kids do these at school when I used to teach, and they um, they like this. But if you'll notice, um, if your horizon line, if you decide to make the painting all about the creek, okay, and you only have this little bit of of light of of sky up here, if we count the curves, we've got one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, about 10 curves. So if you're standing on the same place and you're up higher, all this has to do with eye level. This first one you're down and you're looking at, at a bird's eye, uh, a worm's eye view. You're looking from the ground up. Um, as it moves through, you're, you're going higher and higher to where you're a bird's eye view and you're looking more down on the landscape. So that depends on how your terrain is, if you've got hills or if you're standing on flat land and how you position yourself as you're taking your photographs. Um, I move, I have learned through the years uh, becoming a better photographer to uh, move my body a lot uh, for more reasons than one, because we, we sit here too long. I've got some sciatic pain because I've been on the computer way too much lately, but um, move yourself and look from lots of different vantage points. 
before you make your decision. Uh, but you'll notice down here on the bottom, if you count the curves, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All ten of the curves are in. So what you've got to do is compress them, but make sure you get all the curves in. Now, you may decide that, um, that you don't want to put that many curves in. That's your decision. But just remember, don't oversimplify it because it will look funny. It'll look off if you don't if you don't put them in there correctly, the way that you see them. Um, and, and we're talking about ellipses here. So I don't know what happened here. My PowerPoint says it's doing an auto recovery. Can y'all still see? You can still see? Okay, it didn't go off. So again, the whole point here is to fit the 10 curves in, to compress them and make them fit. The lower the horizon level, the more elliptical the curve of the surface, if the surface is flat. Oh, that's what happened. Something happened to my, my screens. Okay. All right. All right, this next segment is about um, a center of interest or your focal point. And um, there's so many different ways to enhance or, or feature a part of your painting, no matter what it is. Uh, the focal point is, of course, the most predominant and beautiful area in a painting. It's the place you want to take your viewer. Um, it's further enhanced when it contains a bullseye effect by adding some beautiful color or a, a sharp value contrast, lights and darks. So those are, um, those are key elements. The star, keep the surrounding area subordinate. Remember, remember uh, Gene Parker will say, remember the Marilyn Monroe, right? What's your Marilyn Monroe and who are your supporting actresses or actors? Um, and so that's really key. And this is something you have to be deliberate about because most of us will just move around and work on one thing at a time and get it all finished and then work on the next thing. That's something I saw in the demos this weekend that I watched pieces of is that the artists move around a lot. Most of them do. They don't stay in one area very long. Whatever color brush, uh, color, Richard Schmidt said this, whatever's uh, on his brush, he likes to go ahead and use that wherever else he sees it in the painting. And that keeps you a little more fresh and it keeps you from overworking an area. But if you have to make yourself a little note like Gail LeVay does um, in the beginning as to what's your focal point and what edges are gonna be hard, what edges are gonna be soft, where's most of your color gonna be, that will help you stay on track. So um, those are just tips on how to keep your focal focal. Be careful about blocking. Uh, this painting of ships here, the second painting is by Amanda Lovett. It's just beautiful, but this dark has um, a little tendency to block the viewer. Uh, you, be, the ship is painted so beautifully that you skip over it and you go right to the, the focal point of the ship and the, the blue water but I think you have to be careful with having too dark of an area in the foreground. Um, I love, I don't know who did this painting and it's pretty pixelated, but um, I love that they put the light down here in the lower third and all the corners pretty much except up here are shadowed. Let me move that one out of the way. All the corners are shadowed. So you have, um, focal point being vignetted in the middle here. And that's important. You want to be careful with what you do on the corners. If you over, um, if you do too many details in the corners, you risk taking somebody up there and away from your center, uh, center of interest. The bottom painting here um, by someone named D. Beard. Um, let me make it a little bit bigger. 
the lighting is what's focal point here. Again, it's kind of in the lower or the side thirds here. You've got the sun that's real glowy here and the, the light on the, on the path. Um, but it's, it, I think it's beautifully done in this uh, cool color over here. So you've got such a variety in these trees in the background and this beautiful cool color. But you know where the center of interest is. There's no missing the, the, the focal point. Um, this one will be in your notes, so I'll let you go through that and read, read through that. Um, be sure that your focal point supports the main idea. Uh, and I always ask myself, what is it that drew me to this? What is it that I love about the portrait? What is it that I love about this scene? Um, make sure you keep the main thing the main thing. And watch out for getting too busy. That's always a problem. Here are a few, this is another in that uh, PDF, that free PDF, and they talk a little bit about uh, the dominant color in this top painting is green. The red provides contrast to the greens. It's the complement. Um, helps draw the viewer's eye. Anytime you put red, you got to know you're going to draw the viewer in to that red. So you have to be kind of careful with how you use red. Um, and the, but the focal point obviously is right here with the white houses and the red boat. And it, it, it's an area that's lit really well. Uh, don't always have that, that luxury when you're outside. Depends on the, the weather and the time of day and the lighting. So that's where you have to become really good at observing. Just like I watch a model on the stand while, while she's on a break or while I'm getting things ready and I'll catch her at, at a, in a pose that's really beautiful. Um, same with being outdoors with the landscape. You want to go, you know, I hear landscape painters say they go the day before and they make notes about how the light looks at different times of the day and maybe make color notes. And then they go back the next day and make sure that they have adequate time to work. And maybe they go back every day at that same time to finish a painting. It seems like a lot of trouble, but it's, you know, catching your subject at the right time in the right pose is very, very important. So a lot of work goes into paintings that people don't realize. Uh, so that's why when you grab somebody else's work and you think, oh, I'll just copy that, I like that. Uh, and I see this happen all too often that people will do that. It's like a lot of work has gone into creating a piece of art and um, just, just be careful about that. Uh, this bottom painting, it says the viewer's eye is first attracted to the cattle and then to the barn. And it's, it's so small, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but the, the roof of the barn is like an arrow. So you want to watch your arrows. You know, I, I, I'll come around sometimes and go, this is an arrow. And people will say, I don't, oh, I didn't even notice that. So you want to make sure your arrows point the right way. All right, this next one, where to place your center of interest. Um, you've got this scene down at the bottom is um, the houses on the bluff is the area where the most color is, right in here. Um, but you can move throughout the painting. There's lots of different little color spots that help you move around through the painting. Now it's small, so I know it's kind of hard for you to see in this small, but if you can see things in a little thumbnail, uh, sometimes that will, will be the proof in the pudding of whether it's successful. And there's also some diagonal lines in here. So think about diagonals, think about color, how you move around. This is a, just kind of a um, review of what we've talked about already. It's some more thumbnails. I mean, this is in your worksheets. Um, the S-curve, the, um, again, this, this one is bird's eye view or worm's eye view on this first one. Anybody want to tackle that? Paula, are you raising your hand? Oh, we can't hear you. Bird's eye view. I mean, it's worm's eye view. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you're down low. 
and you're looking up like you were a worm. Okay. So, and that's another important thing to ask yourself if you're doing a still life composition, you, you know, if you're looking down on the top of the table, it's more like a, a, a woman who's going to work on items on the table. Like you're fixing to sit down and eat. If you're looking at them straight ahead, it's, it's just kind of an average look. You don't usually look at items on a table from an eye level, but if you place them up on a pedestal, suddenly they've become very uh, regal and noble almost. So placement and the same with your landscape, you get a very different feel if you're down low and you're looking up on the, on the terrain, or if you're standing on top of a hill and you're looking down into the terrain. So Think about your eye level as well. You know, make yourself a little note to decide your eye level from the get-go before you um, set yourself up. Um, here's the cross with the sailboats. That's an obvious, the triangle. That's kind of a repeat. The steel yard, the radiating lines. And these are just a little bit bigger. You can see these thumbnails a little bit better. And then the circular. So probably these are the six most common ones that you see. Um, so that, that's a good one just to make little notes of. Um, this next little segment is leading the viewer's eye and how you might do that. Now, obviously this bright orange right here, almost smack dab in the middle, it's down low, but um, the road comes in um, in order to keep the eye moving through the painting, they, they're repeating the color. So there's orange in several different places. There's blue, the two complements in several different places that kind of, this is a blue shadow. This is more purple and warm on the front of the painting. So, um, and the, it's mostly about sky because the, the whole focal point happens down here in the lower third. So there's a lot of sky and then there's not much land. Um, Let's see, he says in here, um, having a primary um, color and then a secondary color. Uh, so the primary color in this would be what, do you think? The yellow. Okay. And, and this this yellowish color, and then definitely the orange, whatever the magnet for the eye, where does your eye go bzz, to? And because this is a big round shape, this yellow leads you up to it, but the orange is, is kind of the primary color that you see first. Um, and so the rest is a lot softer and cooler. A strong color will jump out at you. So you remember that as you're planning your paintings. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking primary and secondary. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yellow would be the primary. Yeah, I got you, Amy. I know, I'm covering a lot of stuff here. So, um, yeah, the, the first thing you see, the magnet is that big orange bush, but the yellow is sort of the secondary color and then the blue. So it kind of has radiates out in, in the level of intensity as well. Um, you're always better if you don't overdo your color. Um, I think sometimes we overdo, we find a color that's so beautiful. We just want to put it everywhere. So if you're careful with that um, and you just, it's more effective sometimes if you just put a little, like I say all the time, if you're painting lips, don't do the whole lips red, do beautiful shadow colors, do some highlights, and then just put a little bit of a beautiful rose color on the lips. Don't make the whole things that beautiful rose color, even though you love it, you want to use the whole tube of it reserve your, you know, pull, pull back a little bit. Um, back to visual paths here. Um, you see that you come in from the top here down this mountainside. You enter from the left, the fog or the light is coming in from the upper left on this top painting, which is again a natural way because we read from left to right. Uh, this second image, you come in, the creek leads you in from the side of the painting. Um, and then it zigzags you back through here. The trees let you zigzag. Um, the two bottom images are just a little bit of variety on. The first one, the path, is a, is a little too straight. It shoots you down too fast. The second one, they have just put a few little 
um, angles in the path, which slow it down. And they've also opened up, it doesn't say this, but you can kind of want to walk around the back of that tree there. It's lit right there and soft. And so it kind of pulls you in. See the difference in those? I think it's helpful to compare those two and see. Um, this one, the logs help. Uh, you read this from the front in a zigzag pattern, but the logs help lead you in. Now it stops you right here, but there's light back here and it's, it continues to zigzag back here. So if we, if we start, let's go this way, zig, zag, zig, zag zig end on a zig <laughs> you can do this in subtle ways and you can move people through your painting instead of just having it stop just read like a snapshot boom um, the bottom one the red bridge obviously is the focal point because of the red even though it's at a distance uh, i'm not sure about this big rock that looks like a turtle in the foreground <laughs> That's kind of an odd thing, but um, notice how these S curves kind of lead you back to the focal point. One example. Here's some more logs, and I, this is in one of my books on um, painting landscapes, and the, log, the first log is too straight, and it kind of leads you out like an arrow of the picture. The second one has some little broken branches on it, so they slow you down a little bit. It doesn't just like skate you right off the painting. Um, and, and the third one says the better option might be to take the log out because it's just too much of an arrow um, and just follow the shoreline through. So again, you, these are decisions you have to make if you're going to be a landscape painter. Very rarely, and, and Paula, you might speak to this, but very rarely do you sit down and it's just perfect and you paint it exactly the way you see it. You do have to make some decisions uh, based on weather, based on how things are positioned, what's in your way. Um, the more you know. That used to be a commercial, didn't it? Um, we also have a comfortable way of entering. Hey, Carol, she figured out how to get her camera on. Yay! Welcome. <laughs> she's on a boat dock, y'all. Uh, Norma, she's at Dale Hollow. Norma's, Norma's from up that way. Um, which dock is it, Carol? Willow, Willow. Oh, her, she's muted. Willow something, she told me earlier. Grove. Willow Grove. Yeah. And she was able to get her Wi-Fi on. So we're so excited. I'm so excited she could. You got lots of painting opportunities up there too this week. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so here I want to show you these two different, uh, this one has been flipped. Which one feels most natural to you? Anybody want to jump in on there? Let me show you again. From the right or from the left? From the left. Wonder why? As we read left to right. <laughs> yeah, again, it's just funny how, um, whoops, there's a different one, but it's just funny how that feels awkward. Mm -hmm. it, it just feels a little awkward. And the same way when you set up a still life on a table, if you, if you lead things in this way, it just feel from the right, it feels a little awkward. It just feels more comfortable to light things and lead from the left. Now, if you're left-handed, it, it might not be the case. Uh, anybody, anybody here feel better with it this way? I don't know. I'm the oddball. I like to tell them the right, but I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you know, I'm odd. No, it's fine. And I, I know, um, a lot of times when I'm doing things with students that are left-handed, they will feel more comfortable with it the opposite way. So, I liked it better on the right as well. You did. See, yeah. and I was thinking about you, Charlotte. Um, I knew you, you would say that. So 
Um, <laughs> it's, it's how we just don't realize how our subconscious and our default modes play into our choices. Are they right or wrong? No, they're just what feels comfortable to us. So this might appeal to somebody uh, more that is left-handed or Amy, are you left-handed? I don't think she's left-handed, but she still likes it that way better. Uh, no, I'm right-handed, but I'm kind of ambidextrous too. Okay. I do some things left-handed. So it just felt, I don't know, it just felt better on the okay. right. Yeah. And, and that's important. I have this, have people do this in recovery sometimes when we talk about it to put their hands together and see which thumb is, is, is uh, in front. And for me, my left thumb is in front and it feels comfortable. If I switch it and put my right thumb in front, it's like, ugh, that feels weird. So you have to realize, does anybody have your right thumb in front? Norma, you do? I do. That feels I more comfortable. Do. Left. I do Left. too. Right. So C, is one right or wrong? No. No. <laughs> But that tells us again that the things that we uh, feel instinctive to us are very different. So going back to that Mozart thing, you know, we're all meant to do totally different things and we feel more comfortable with different things. So it's like, I tell this in class all the time, it's you cannot compare apples to oranges or apples to grapes. When you put two of those side by side, they are different animals. So we need hey, to- Christy. Yeah. Alyssa wants to share something real quick. Go, Alyssa. You got to say something. Aww. Oh. <laughs> she does art with us every week, or she always likes to show her art. That is awesome, Alyssa. I do my art a lot. <laughs> you are doing a great job, girl. Thank you. Okay. Keep going. Hey. Thank, Thank you for showing it. That's, that spurs us on. We need to create like a kid with no inhibitions. So that was timely right there. Get rid of your inhibitions, throw them out the window. Um, so he here back to the, the path, the S curve, where does this path go? And how does this leave you in this painting? Is there a, is there a, um, a feeling about it one way or the other? I like to have, uh, I like to have some interest back there and not just disappear, the path to not just disappear. So I like to have light or color or a little bend to make me go, I wonder what's around that corner. I want to go, you know, just like if you're out hiking and you, you see something in the distance and you want, it makes you want to keep going. Carol, did you have a thought about it? Always wave to me. Or are you just putting your hand up here? Okay. Oh no, I just scratched my ear. <laughs> okay. No, the other Carol too. Uh, please interrupt me and jump in if, if you have any experience or any thoughts about any of these things. Here's another one with the, where does the path go? Um, there is kind of a path right here. There's some shadows that block it. Um, it there's sort of a continuation of something back here, but it's, it's pretty, it's kind of muddy right here. So be sure you're telling a story with your path and you just haven't, randomly stuck a path in there and it doesn't really go anywhere doesn't really draw the viewer in again no rules about this you do whatever you want to so i have helped people with paintings before and they've just had a little piece of the path showing so there's all and it worked beautifully so well and those shadows back on the, the other one they look like two bottles right here yeah and i, they do. I but i don't know my eye goes to that and goes two bottles i don't see any bottles in there I know. Like the shadows are just not quite right. <laughs> and and sometimes when you get busy painting, you lose your objectivity. You get uh -huh. so busy painting on a shape that you're not really seeing it anymore. And then you the next morning you get up and you go, oh my gosh, there's two bottles on there. You didn't even see that when you were painting them. So again, why it's important to get up and stretch and get away from it, rest maybe, your eyes from it. Maybe it was letting you sit there and think oh i would like a glass of wine when i get to looking at this picture <laughs> could be could be very also, well i'll take a picture you know step away and take a picture of it and then look at my photo and sometimes i could see mistakes oh absolutely Carol. right the same thing with a mirror 
you know, you can mm -hmm. pop it in, a, you can hold it up in front of a mirror and anything that's off will immediately pop out. It's because you're tricking your eye into thinking it's a new picture. Your brain, uh, your brain sort of gets fatigued and right. it will just, it'll, that picture will stall out in your brain. And when you flip it onto a camera or a mirror, all of a sudden your brain goes, oh, new picture. Let me look at this. And it will give you a better information about it. So it's a great habit to develop for yourself. Here's another path that, um, you know, it's, it's a good painting. It, it just stops. And does it take you to a beautiful place or does it pull you in? Um, I don't know. It, it, it could be, there could be some things that might be better. It's a curve. So it's not wrong. It's not like a straight shot, but it, it, um, it didn't really pull me in too much. This next little segment, and I'm going to let you do this on your own because it's very valuable. So, um, because, but it's going to take you a few minutes to do it. So first off, I'm going to show you some paintings that have fence posts or um, some kind of dock posts or something in them. And then here's another fence. And I want to talk about that in a minute. I'll come back to that. Here's some rows. This is Connie uh, Coonley again. It's called Take the Back Road Home. Um, but you see how the path kind of comes in from the front, goes around this row. But the rows of corn or whatever this is, they also are spaced properly and on perspective. Um, so these are just several examples. Here's Roger Dale Brown's painting that I'm sending you the link for if you want to watch the demo of him painting this. And he yes. gives lots of good information on this. Um, but here's some more fence posts and kind of leading you in. There's a fence that goes across and there's a fence that comes in. And you don't think about how to paint fence posts and the differences in them. Uh, here's John Potoshnik again. Potoshnik, he's got fence, a fence here, but he doesn't block you out. He's got, you know, opening with the light. So you come in, you zigzag. And then the cows are, are small and they're soft. And you've got this nice atmosphere back here. Um, one more, another one of John Potoshnik's. Look how the fence post, if you get a um, pencil, and I did this yesterday when I added this into the PowerPoint, and you measure this first fence post, this last fence post is one fourth the height of this first fence post. So your brain will not read it that way. Your brain will go boop, 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 and you'll make them almost all the same. But if you'll, like I always have you measure and compare things, your brain will not believe that that's one fourth of this size until you measure it. So the worksheet is a interval spacing worksheet. And it's so helpful, not just with fences and posts, but also with books. Like if you have a, a bookshelf that goes back, um, you're looking down the side of books. And if you'll notice what, what the, um, uh, Laura George gave me this worksheet and I love it. I don't know where it came from, but it's been so helpful. Um, you have the first post and then you go ahead and place the second post. And then the, the next image, you put a cross through it. Okay. The third image, you go from the top of the first post through the, uh, you draw this line. I forgot to tell you to draw the line down the middle. If you want to space them evenly, now usually they're random and a fence will look too straight if you do them too perfectly spaced, but this is how to get them evenly spaced and into perspective. So you draw a line through the intersection of that first post and that'll tell you where to put the second post. And then you do the same thing here. You'll draw a line through this post, through the intersection, and it'll tell you right where to put the next post. And they're going to get smaller. And you see, they get smaller and smaller as they go down. Um, great exercise. And you one you will pull back out later. I don't know what you might use it for, but never thought to do this. And it had to be shown this. Um, but that is a wonderful way to make things evenly spaced as they move back into space. Has anybody ever seen this worksheet before or done this before? No, it's new. Good. I hope I'm giving you something new here and not um, totally blowing your head off here. Here's another worksheet. And I'll, I'll um, again, I'm going to send you that one, but 
if you just get the first box right, then you can just keep going with that. So get that first box drawn and allow, you need a ruler to do this as well. So um, here's another worksheet I found on Pinterest that shows you just a sketch. And I think it'd be great to draw this out yourself, just to sit, you know, in your spare time. We, we had a sketchbook challenge <clears throat> um, earlier this year where you had everybody was challenged to put your sketchbook out and to spend at least five minutes a day doing some quick sketches in there. That will propel your skills more than anything if you just draw a little bit every day. And these, these worksheets I'm going to send you will give you some good material. Just print them and st or put them on your phone. You can save the PDF on your phone. You've always got your phone with you. Pull your phone up and sit there and sketch through some of these exercises. And he's kind of doing the same thing here, but he didn't go as far as to um, do the crisscrosses in them, which show you uh, the interval spacing. <clears throat> I'm going to skip down through there. We've got, we've got about 25 more minutes left. Does anybody have any questions or any thoughts? I haven't really paused very much. I'm so excited about all this stuff. I just get going 100 miles an hour. And one of the things I've had to learn with Zoom is to let there be some uncomfortable pauses. Um, because it takes a while to unmute yourself and Sometimes people are hesitant to speak, so I'm learning to take a few pauses. All right, I'll keep going. We've got a few more minutes of class left. Um, what to include? How do I get better at editing my compositions? Um, you know, once you've decided your focal point, what it is that you love, 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 um, then, you know, and, and your painting should be about one thing, uh, you know, have one Marilyn Monroe and then your supporting actors. Um, maybe it's shapes and colors, maybe it's the beautiful trees, uh, maybe it's patterns. Um, but again, I go back to your rough drafts, um, make sketches, uh, make several of the same subject. Uh, and then the more you do that, it helps you get to know your subject as well. Um, it, it's surprising how once I'll draw an area and shade it in, I'll always remember that. I'll always remember that big shadowed area. And so it kind of makes a little imprint of it in your brain. That thumbnail will be a little snapshot in your brain as you work through the painting. Um, it, when you're doing those rough nails, rough, those thumbnails, rough drafts, notice how if you take out and leave things and then you lay all the little rough drafts out together, you can see which things work better and which things don't. All too often we just jump in and we don't take the time to look at, at, at our options. What, what might work better? Um, this, this is out of that landscape PDF I'm going to send you and it says to combine uh, reference photos. So, you know, one, one may, convey one idea. Um, I have a book that I love that shows um, how the artists use photos uh, with like a one guy's fishing and then he used another photo of a dog and then he used another photo of the water and so he put like five different photos together and made a beautiful composition with it. So um, don't feel like you're just stuck with the one thing that's in front of you, but do your homework and, and, and use other reference photos. Um, here's a little test um, shot for us. This is um, Jay Claire. I follow him or her. I can't remember if it's a man or a woman um, on Instagram. And I love the painting. I love it when people take a picture of their painting with the scene they're painting with it. Um, it just feels like I'm standing over their shoulder watching what they're doing. What elements did um, this artist leave out? Motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Anything else? The little no, tent covered thing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Um, there's a lot of things they left out. Uh, this pile of wood on the left, all this junk that's piled up. 
Um, notice how the the stick that's leaning here. What did what did they do with the stick? Uh, she leaned it against the wall. Pointed to the door. Yeah, that's cool. Pointed to the door. Um, notice like the sh the it. what Heather? Looks like she cleaned it up a bit. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, like the picture okay. looks kind of like the top, like above the door, like it looks like it's moldy or something. Yeah. Something. I can't know what it is, but it like the picture looks much nicer. I yeah. mean, not, um, not the picture, the but the art. Yeah, the painting. Thank you. And that's our job, you know, is to even to find, you know, there's a, I believe it's Ken Alster who ha has um, a series of paintings of just alleys and funky places. And if you can take a funky place and make a, something beautiful out of it, um, that you, you know, if you're painting a beautiful sunset or a gorgeous baby, half your work is done for you. But if you take something that's very ordinary and even trashy and dirty and make it something very beautiful, then I'm, I'm going to tell you, you've been successful on a lot of levels. Um, he, he obvious, they obviously painted um, at a time of day when the shadows were long because the shadow over that door is beautiful. There's no shadow at whatever time of day at the end of the day when he had taken the picture, I guess the light was shining right on that door. Uh, but you see long shadows here. Uh, on the, you see long shadows on the sidewalk, which help lay the sidewalk down. So anytime you're painting a path that's flat or a creek, you want to make sure that you have horizontal marks in there to make it lay down. So that's another important element. Is um, the the roof line? Did they change that? It looks looks to me like they gave more room over the blue door. And yes. utilized a lot of that background that uh, on the side of the to the uh if you're looking at it, the right hand side past the door is wider in the painting that it is in the row right. Line. Good observation. It is. So they stretched it out a little bit because this is the focal point. Right. So if it had just been this little piece over here and you had all this junk, it wouldn't have been as as interesting. Great observations. Uh, you know, again, I think looking at what other people do and these observations together really makes you see differently. And I think it's as much a um, exercise and uh, education as, as taking notes. Let's see if I have another one here. Yes, I love this one. Uh, Ignat Ignatov, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but I love following his work on Instagram. Um, he's taken a picture of his scene. Um, notice how he translated what he saw. What did he do differently? Well, he brought it in closer. He cropped it, evidently. Yep. And, oh, I don't know. It just has a really neat feel compared to just looking out there. I mean, I wouldn't have thought to do whatever it is he's done. I really like it. That's... And he's used diagonals and zigzags. Yes. Which you don't just obviously see but also a lot of times I notice there's you'll have a lot of grass or f something in the foreground that's very boring right so if he'd have painted all this grass in the foreground with just this little bitty boat um, the percentage of the boat of the focal point is so small that it th that you had all this boring space but what does he do he crops up and he makes the blue more powerful Right. And, and he makes the blue zigzag up to the boat, right. more, more interesting, more beautiful. He raises these grasses up and overlaps to, to give you a feeling of depth. And, and overlapping is another really good tool to use to help step your viewer back and give you a sense of depth. It also gives you a feeling of wanting to see what, what's behind that stuff he's got there. You know, he doesn't have a lot of it, just enough to... For me to make me want to go, what's, oh, that's a boat, you know, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I really like that. And then the bright, uh, the grass, you know, he, he translated this bright grass and made it even brighter. And right. it, it's around the focal point, which I'll do around portraits sometimes. I'll put a really pretty color right here, maybe, and right here, mm. um, kind of in an asymmetrical way. And it just kind of leads the eye to the, to the focal point a little bit more. Um, again, don't 
the, the thing to, to get out of this whole session is be careful about, I know it's hard to get to your easel. It's hard to get painting time, but be careful about just plopping down and just doing whatever's in front of you. Do a little bit of, of the rough drafts of thinking ahead of time and planning. Um, no amount of paint will fix a bad composition. And I can't tell you how many times I've been at a workshop or something and I'm harassed, I'm nervous, and I'll just plop down and pick a bad spot and then I'll work myself to death instead of really walking around the model or looking at the, you know, walk around the scene before you decide. If you're out and you're taking pictures you wanna paint from later, and that's a whole nother subject, but take a lot of pictures. Walk around and take, you know, 50 pictures of a subject and then decide, you know, maybe that's too many, maybe that's overwhelming, but proper planning prevents poor performance. You know, that's my saying. <laughs> and there's, it, it goes a little further. Piss poor performance is what it actually says. Um, here's a little exercise for you later as well, because we are getting the time's ticking down. Um, but I found this little drawing and it's very bold. It looks like it's done in ink or maybe it's even a computer drawing. But I thought it would be a great exercise for you to see if you can vary the line weight. You can make some, some of the lines lighter. And, and I'm going to show you an example of that here in a second. Um, so that you emphasize the focal point a little better. It's pretty well done because it gets lighter and looser as it moves to the, the periphery of the, of the drawing. But see if you can draw this. Think about the fence posts. It's got a lot of the elements we've talked about. It's got the zigzags. And see if you can improve on this and, and make this a little bit more effective. Um, let me find my line weight example. I thought I had it in here. I don't. Darn it. Let's see how many things I have going here. Um, well, anyway, the darker the line, the more the line's going to come at you. And the lighter the line, the more it will go back in into space. Whoops, I got way too far back. Sorry. Um, so practice a little bit with your line weight and, um, and see if you can help push the viewer back or, or pull the viewer back or draw the eye. And that's mostly in drawing because with drawing, all you have is your lightness and darkness and your line weight, how heavy or light a line is. This one is on competing subjects and um, how do you know where to look? <laughs> These are all pretty busy. Um, don't know who the painters are. They didn't have any names, but I was just looking for some examples to show you. Uh, the upper right is, is really fun. It's kind of a modern fun type painting that you'll see on Pinterest, uh, but it's so colorful and it's done so sharp and, contra and uh, contrasty that you don't really know where the focal point is. It's, it's busy. Would you agree? It's busy. So uh, the one on the left, I don't really know what's going on with this. It's a primitive. Um, what is the focal point? Somebody jump in there. Any idea? The big stone. The big stone. Maybe that's because the light is there. Right. Well, I didn't know with the fire, I didn't know if that was a cave entrance. I was going to say the fire and the cave entrance. Oh, well, it could be. <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> flipping that. <laughs> yeah, you're Amy, I did not even see that. I thought it was a big yellow rock. Yeah, me too. But maybe it is a cave <laughs> entrance. So there again, um, it's yellow, but I want you to see how um yellow comes forward. Mm -hmm. And it's coming forward so much it looks like a rock. <laughs> so also all the people are or moving around it is a lot of stuff going on. It's hard to know where to look with it. Uh, sometimes when you're so busy, it can, it can tire the eye and it can make you not, you just go, I gotta go past this one. It's a little too chaotic for me. Uh, same with the bottom. There's lots of lines and colors. So how this applies with your trees, and we're gonna talk more about that next week, but if you get too much busyness going on in your trees, too many leaves. If you try to paint all six million leaves on a tree, what's going to happen? You're going to break all the form. It's not going to be interesting. So you want to simplify. You want to simplify and you want to watch your subjects. This tree, these rocks, these things, they all kind of compete. You don't really know which thing to look at. 
Uh, here's another, and it's a little blurred, I apologize, but this has two main focal points. Wouldn't you agree? Um, which one would you say is the star? Which do you see first? The flower and fence. Yeah. I, th I think the bench and the flower right here in the foreground you see, and, and it's okay. I mean, it's a beautiful painting. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's this that you have two focal points. So you can make that work. Uh, he, the, the artist has blurred this a bit, unless it's just my painting. So you would want to do that. You would want to subdue the color back here so that you have a, a star and then a co-star. Somebody else have a thought about it? Okay. Um, again, with this one, uh, competing subjects here, you have a buffalo and you have this big, heavy tree in the foreground. Um, what could the artist have done differently with this? It stepped back really well because the, the mountains are really nice and foggy and atmospheric. I gotta brought the buffalo forward. Okay. Just so tiny. Like I, cause I, I'm like, is the tree or the buffalo? It seems like the buffalo is a little more kind of like that deer was mm -hmm. those three deer. Like they brought it forward. Yes. Yes. Good point, Heather. And you could make this more colorful and interesting. It's okay. kind of drab and it kind of disappears in with the landscape. So you really just have this huge, big, uninteresting tree in the foreground. Um, it might have been there. And it's like um, Shane Neal always says, you know, you got to be careful. There's a light socket in the wall. There's a fly. Just because it's there doesn't mean we have to paint it in. <laughs> You know, so, so be really careful with what you include and what you don't include. Um, here's another busy one. There's a lot of subjects in here. There's trees and cows and a house and hay bales and fences and roads. But is it, are they confusing? Has he been successful with competing subjects? What do you think? I think so, because he's muted the back. Um, it's like the house Ooh. to me is the Hi, viewpoint. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just hit a button. What did I do? Here we go. I think I think it's successful. I do too. Yeah. Notice how the hay bales get a little smaller and they kind of lead you, but there's an opening to go around the hay bales. If he'd gone all the way across the front, it would have blocked the front. So there is a bit of an opening. You kind of read it for me. I kind of read it this way and then down the road to the house and then you land on the house and you look and take that in. And then you notice the cows back here. Um, I think it's very beautiful and very successful with lots of different things going on. I just noticed there's a man there in front of the house. Oh, He's yeah. Got a little bit of red on him. Yep. I just he, saw that. He looks, him. It, as small as he is, Carol, great observation. As small as he is, you can kind of tell that he looks like he's got clippers or something in his something hand. Something in his hand, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Wow. And listen, this man, because we have that seven hour video from him or however long it was, he goes to a lot of planning for his paintings so much so that he builds a little white. Um, when he's doing a white house, he built a white house out of foam core and he oh put it outside word. in the grass because he was using an old photo that didn't have good color in it. So he put that house outside in the grass to note how the color bounced in from the sky and the grass. And so again, um, you, you know, we're probably not all going to go to that much trouble, yeah. but, but um, you see how it's successful. The more you learn, the more you know, the more you educate yourself, the more you're going to, um, you know, enjoy this process and the more you're going to be successful. You don't have to do all this stuff. So I'm going to stop right there and go back because I have, um, I don't know, 20 more slides or something. You know me, I can't just do it a little. I got to do it Texas style. Um, but if you take one or two new things away from this, because I thought, well, we can't do a, a, a study of an old master. We've been just painting like crazy for the last few months um, without doing a little bit of academics, a little bit of what are we thinking about? What do we want to, what are we looking for in a painting that we want to learn from? Um, and I believe that these things will pop up as we're doing the study in the upcoming weeks. Um, I would like to, because I don't have all these, I would like to flip through them quickly as we close. Um, 
uh, this one, the horses, if this horse on the right had been really sharp and bright, it would have led you, those horses would have run you right out the side. But the artist made sure that the horse was dark and blended in and it sort of stopped you. But the dust gives you that feeling of movement. Um, there's fog here. It's, it kind of pulls you in. The fog does. The paintings here, this painting of horses by Kathleen Dunphy, the dust contrasted with these, with no dust. They, that really gives you the sense of movement. Um, and it's just a small thing. It's dust. But it really changes the whole dynamic of the painting. Um, so I wanted to just, there's, there's some slides in here on, um, line, here's the line weight and how you make things smaller as you go back. And this is another one in your worksheets that uh, we could spend some more time on this next week if you want to. I may just survey you and ask you if you want us to spend a little bit more time on this or move on. Um, this is a great exercise for you to do. Uh, you notice how the things in the front are bigger and sharper. And this is easy. This is fun. This is no stress. And notice how the lines get softer and lighter as they move back in the distance and things get smaller as they move back. This tree is darker and sharper and in front of this tree. This one is in front of this tree. And that all has to do with the, the, the heaviness of your line um, and how to do that with paint. Here's another drawing. You go right to the dark, sharp edges. Um, and then with paint, this is how you do it with paint. You make the thing in the front brighter and, and more chromatic. And then as you go back, you make it foggy and more atmospheric and cooler. There's more cool tones. You notice this ball has more blues in it and more white and more blues. And then they've taken a brush and just, um, blurred it and that pushes it back in space so um same i've got just lots of examples of these um what i'll probably do as well is um screenshot most of these and put them on the facebook page so that if you want to go back through and look at some of these um to, to you know overlapping methods um creating depth having a foreground a midground um it's more simple. It, it sounds like a lot of material, but it's not as much as you think when you start to look at it and incorporate these things. Um, this is just a photograph that my pastor sent me one time and it's a beautiful photograph, but could you paint from it? It's everything is sharp and crisp in it. There's no atmosphere in it. So this is the mistake that a lot of people make is they try to paint from a photograph like this without any knowledge of how to create things in in uh, in atmosphere and in depth and making them pushing them back um, like this one from Edgar Payne where you have all that wonderful thick atmosphere to help tell that story so these are the rest uh, there are still a few more worksheets in here and um, that I think will be great for you to have to put in your sketchbook and to use to help you with um, with landscapes any questions or are, are you, is your brain scrambled? Not all my classes are like this. I promise. If you're new, <laughs> um, this is a different kind of a class today. So I hope it was helpful to you. I it was for me. So I appreciate it. Good, good. So and is it best to do these little um, sketches with a pencil or charcoal? or uh, ink you do them whichever way you want to if you're a real uh, persnickety and you want to be able to erase and get it just right use a pencil if you want to just capture and take notes and move fast use a pen and don't worry about it being perfect um, those are two different personality types and goals um, don't don't overthink it but you might want to overthink it because you might want to really, if you love landscapes and you want to really get these concepts, you might want to spend more time with a pencil and eraser and, and a ruler and, um, you know, put these down in your sketchbook. Your sketchbook should really be your, your place of um, uh, experimentation and your textbook. And uh, use, use your sketchbook. We leave them on the shelf far too much. So it's easy to get that sketchbook out while you're watching TV, while you're sitting on the back of the houseboat or the 
or wherever you are, you can grab that sketchbook. And if you have these things on your phone, it'll be instant exercises for you. So cool. it's 12 o'clock. I have love you guys make me feel so good. I love being with you. I can feel your excitement about doing art through the, through the zoom. Um, I just, I thank you for logging on. And uh, if you're not on the Facebook page, please send me a text or an email and I'll be sure to invite you. We'll have to be friends first, but I post a lot of information there. If you would like to get a reminder right before class, a little text reminder with the link. Um, also ask me about that and I'll send you the little, you'll have to opt in for that. Uh, if for some reason you're not wanting to do classes or for a period, you can always tell me to take you off of that, but it's a quick little reminder so you don't forget class. So, um, awesome. I loved being with y'all. Any any other questions or concerns? All right. Well, y'all. If you have work through the week and you want to send me anything for critique, I'm happy to critique for you. Um, I oftentimes don't get to that until later in the week. Friday's my critique day when I don't have any children here, but I'm happy to do that and send you a side by side. Norma sent me something yesterday. And I'll put it in Photoshop and I'll grayscale it and I'll send you some um, feedback on your work. So cool. that's, that's part of class. I'm always happy to do that with my current students or, or as much as I can with anybody. So great having you, Paula and Carol's. I'm so glad to have you new girls. And Teresa, I'm glad you were back. I'm hey, praying that I won't you be here next week because okay. I have to go back to see my surgeon have the stitches moved. Well, pray well, I'm you heal, recorded. girl. All right. Yeah, I'll send you the recording of it. All right, guys. Y'all have a fabulous week. Hey, you Thank too. You. Thank you.